Sam Cedar on the Majority Report. It is a pleasure to welcome back to the program Harold Meyerson, editor at large at the American Prospect. Harold, welcome back to the program. Good to be here, Sam. So when I uh, teased your appearance, I said that this Semex rule uh, change is perhaps the most empowering um, for unions decision that is made by the uh, the National Labor Relations Board in decades. Did I overstate that or, or give me your sense? Uh, the short answer is no. Uh, it is indeed that. And it may be the most uh, helpful to workers and unions decision the NLRB has made in half a century. So, okay. So um, let's w walk us through this um, uh, because this is I, I mean, I remember, you know, we were just uh, talking about the, the prescription drug stuff. And one of the things we kept hearing over and over again for decades, literally for decades, I mean, since uh, Clinton was, we're, we're going to have Medicare uh, negotiate uh, drugs with, uh, you know, uh, for drugs or Medicare uh, negotiate for drugs. The big thing 20 years ago was card check, card check, card check, card check. That was one of the big disappointments that uh, you know that didn't happen during the obama administration uh and this is sort of like card check light what walk us through what this uh what this does sure well you know the democrats are aware that uh the national labor relations act has been steadily weakened by court decisions and uh uh some of the nlrb rulings when they were controlled by republicans uh, and they've been trying to strengthen uh, labor law basically all the way back to Lyndon Johnson's presidency. And every time they've tried under Johnson, under Carter, under Clinton, under Obama, they have never gotten to 60 votes in the Senate. Uh, so uh, it, as a result, when in, in the private sector, when workers try to unionize, it's a very, very common practice for employers to do things that are illegal, according to the National Labor Relations Act, uh, like firing the workers who are leading the campaign to unionize, for which the penalties are virtually non-existent. And because this has been completely the norm, uh, increasingly for the last 40 years, uh, most unions have ceased doing major organizing campaigns. Uh, I remember when John Sweeney was running for the presidency, the AFL-CIO in 1995, one of his talking points was that the uh, if you added up all the unions and looked at their budgets, they were spending about three percent of their budgets on organizing because they knew they would lose. All right, uh, the new not new, but Biden's appointee confirmed by the Senate as general counsel of the National Labor Relations Board, and she is basically the boss of all 500 lawyers working for the board across the country. Jennifer Abruzzo has been determined to, uh, as much as it is possible, restore that original National Labor Relations Act, which was written to give workers the right to collectively bargain, restore it to you know the point at which it was effective. Um, she put that out in a memo shortly after she took office in a memo to her lawyers and she got a case that she brought before the board, which the board uh, issued the, this, this Semex decision on Friday. What the decision says is, if enough workers to constitute a majority uh, have made clear they wish to affiliate with a union by signing cards or some other measure, the employer then has a choice. The employer can voluntarily recognize the union which 99.9% .9 of the time the employer will not do, or the employer is legally obligated to file for a board-run uh, a board run election. Then, here's the teeth in the decision, then if the employer commits an unfair labor practice, the very sorts of things they routinely commit by uh, forcing workers to go to propaganda meetings that are anti-union by firing uh, pro-union workers and so on. Those are unfair labor practices, but there's been no penalty. In this case, if the employer during the run-up to the election or during the election itself commits an unfair labor practice, wham, the union is immediately recognized 
and uh, the company is ordered immediately to commence bargaining with the union. That is a huge change. Okay, so prior to this, let's just go, like, because one of the examples I used yesterday was Bessemer. When uh, Amazon workers at Bessemer, Alabama, I think it was, it was a warehouse, right. um, they, they signed uh, cards, they want to get a union, so they, uh, they apply, essentially, to National Labor Relations Board. The National Labor Relations Board looks at those cards, determines that they're valid, and says, okay, we're going to issue uh, an election, right? Because Amazon obviously does not want to have a union. Right, right. And then the, and the election uh, is always, like, was, like, how long out? Was there, are there, are there constraints on how long out that election has to take place within? Ab- absolutely not. And delay is a common tactic of employers who do not, uh, you know, want to have a union. Uh, it can be delayed, and you know, the more you delay it, uh, you know, the, the 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 less workers generally uh, are determined still to push through. And in the case of Amazon, where the average Amazon warehouse worker lasts about eight months on the job before the demands of the job, which are ridiculous, just wears that worker out, and he or she quits. Uh, you know, a, a delay is fatal, but it's plus. Fatal plus, they also, days. I mean, what Amazon does, they bring in managers from all around the country. They, they all of a sudden, it's like three managers for every worker there for a, you know a, a brief period of time. I'm exaggerating, but only slightly. Um, and they bring in young union buster lawyers, and they bring in union busting teams, and they do, and they start to intimidate people, and they do all this, and they, and and so the uh, in Bessemer, the election happens. But afterwards, the union uh, or the would-be union files grievances, and the National Labor Relations Board says, we recognize these grievances, and they call for another election, and they end up losing that election. But now, once they got to that point where they recognize the uh, unfair labor practices, boom, the union exists. Boom, and second boom, uh, the company is or- ordered to uh, go to the bargaining table with the union. And and is there is there constraints? And like, because what, what I've seen in terms of, let's say, Starbucks is, uh, we're negotiating with you. We showed up and uh, you weren't there. Or, you know, we, uh, we, we scheduled it at uh, 5.30 a.m. And uh, it didn't, like, is there any constraints or any sort of like uh, accountability on that part of the process like you you need to start negotiating this far or you have this amount of time or something like that here's the problem that requires a change in the act itself okay and that was actually part of the recent iterations of labor law reform bills that didn't clear the senate those bills said things like well, if there's no first contract by 90 days or 180 days, uh, uh, you know, a government arbitrator will show up and talk to both sides and basically impose a contract. But that requires a change in labor law. However, and I just found this out this morning, uh, the above mentioned Jennifer Abruzzo, who is the best friends uh, union of unionists have had in, in public office since... Robert Wagner, who wrote the NLRA, uh, is pursuing, uh, you know, an interesting question. Uh, you can f- you can file an unfair find an unfair labor practice, and in a company really refusing to bargain in good faith. The question then becomes: since you cannot impose an arbitrator or a contract, what is the remedy once you have found that? Now, the California Agricultural Relations Board, which is its own entity, it's, it, it deals with farm workers who are not covered under the NLRA, has uh, d- issued a, some rulings which say, okay, uh, if the company is not bargaining in good faith, we will make the workers whole uh, by giving them rate, essentially finding a, a, a comparable uh, employer comparable workers who is unionized uh, and uh, you know mandating that the the pay gets raised to that standard and the benefits get raised to that standard etc cetera, etc cetera. Uh, and Abruzzo is putting uh, a case that argues that before the board 
Uh, needless to say, uh, something like that is necessary to deal with the situation you just talked about, Sam. So she is working overtime, forgive the sort of the <laughs> pun, I guess. Um, yeah. She is working overtime to try and figure out how they can put teeth into this provision without running, without bumping up against the statutory limitations that the National Labor Relations Board has. Okay, so I exactly. have some questions. I have some questions for you on on this. Um, the uh, and 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 I went through yesterday, sort of like the uh, you know the genesis of 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 this stuff. I mean, we're we're in some ways coming close to returning to that 1948 Joy Silk doctrine, which yes. and 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 there's an analog here, I think, uh, between the period of time that we have been living in this country since the 19. Uh, early uh, early 80s in uh, antitrust law where we had all the laws on the books but the administration at that time Reagan assumed a, a new sort of doctrine on what constituted antitrust uh, right. under Robert Bork and it destroyed antitrust law as we had known it for decades prior until right. very recently under the Biden administration where they have sort of like resumed the earlier definition of antitrust. And in some ways, we're seeing an analog here with the National Labor Relations Board where it's picking up what used to be the, the sort of mainstream interpretation of the National Labor Relations uh, um, uh, Act and uh, consequences, and it's sort of reinstituting it in some way um, it, it, with, with, this, with, with this Semex decision. Um, what, what constitutes the, a majority of workers um, signing a card authorization. And I know this, that's, I mean, people are out there going, well, 51%, but how do they determine what the unit bargaining, what the unit is of like who constitutes actual workers? Because often this is one of the ways that employers will inhibit unionization by saying, the union thinks it's like we got 300 people in this bargaining unit, but we argue that it's really only 150 or it's 500 because of whatever, whatever they think is most advantageous by saying what the roles of these workers are. How does the National Labor Relations Board determine that? Is that part of the like sort of the petition from the employer? Because they've got two weeks to say we don't think that card check is is valid, essentially. Yes, well, you're right. Uh, and uh, if if the employer does issue something like that, saying this is too few workers or this is too many workers, depending on what the employer thinks is the, the most advantageous number uh, for the employer, uh, then the board itself does. You know, the attorneys, the local board attorneys, do uh, you know hear hear from both sides, do a little mini investigation, and say, okay, this unit. This is the unit that can uh, is entitled to vote on uh, on unionization. So you know the board has five hundred attorneys around the country. It should have more, but uh, it, you know the uh, conservatives in uh, on Capitol Hill have not been uh, too thrilled at uh, expanding uh, you know the number of NLRB attorneys, just like they don't like to expand the number of OSHA inspectors, et cetera, et cetera. But those attorneys make that decision. Okay. Uh so right now, Trader's Joy's, uh, Trader Joe employees have been the first to sort of try and like pick up the ball here uh, in terms of the Semex ruling. Do you have a sense of like what, what, what's going on there? And can you like tell us what, what we can anticipate? No, no I'm not familiar with the latest Trader Joe's thing, except okay. what's available in the, the store that's about six blocks from me. Okay. Well, fair enough. I mean, apparently they, um, you know, they, they are uh, heading um to um to back to the board saying there's been labor uh practice violations since um you know uh since we 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 sought a um a union and i think they're hoping that th this imposition will happen but i guess we we will follow up on that all right so i have another uh, part for you that you know and i i think you know hopefully between today and yesterday people have a sense of like the 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 impact of this i mean it seems to me that like we're going to, this is the summer of unionization or, or really, I mean, this has been growing. It feels like for, for a couple of years, to be honest, but, um, uh, 
we're, we're going to start to see a lot more unions formed. Well, there has been a huge lag between, you know, workers and public opinion on unions and the uh, decrepit law until now. And what, what uh, the, the timing of this is such that it will, uh, you know, empower uh, workers much more than they have been. And, you know, we, we wait to see the union response. Now, Steve Greenhouse and I, the former New York Times uh, labor beat guy for forever, uh, Steve and I wrote a piece in The Prospect about a year ago, maybe, yeah, about a year ago, are saying, okay, in 1935, the National Labor Relations Act was passed. And almost immediately, uh, the more militant unions, uh, and ones that even ha historically hadn't been militant, but decided to become militant, like the mine workers and the amalgamated clothing workers, you know, formed their own CIO, went out and devoted huge resources, immediate, you know, w within, within eight, nine months of, uh, of the Wagner Act uh, passing, before it was uh, upheld by the Supreme Court, which didn't happen for another two years, uh, they went out and, uh, you know, provided huge resources to organizing uh, industry, steel, auto, et cetera. And Greenhouse and I wrote, okay, where the hell are today's unions? Uh, how many of them are spending more than that 3% I, I mentioned earlier in the broadcast? So now I think this is this is a real test for, for unions. And there are about, you know, 10, a dozen or so unions that... Uh, have, you know, considerable organizing departments, uh, but nowhere near what they need to be right now. Now is the time that they should be gearing up and, you know, going at full speed. I mean, you know, okay, it's been, what, four days since the decision. Right, right, so it right. It takes a little longer than that. But, um, you know, the starter's gun, which no one had been able to even locate for half a century, has just gone off. Okay, how much did they anticipate this? Like, I mean, did the teams, like, because, and, and to be clear, the Semex case, they were going in and saying, um, we lost our election to have a union at this place called Semex, the Teamsters. We wanted to, we, we, uh, we wanted to, uh, you know, we, we filled out our cards. We got the, the election date. But um, in between that time, um, you know, this is after the election. They've lost the election. It was a very close election. They came to the National Labor Relations Board and they said they were doing stuff like, you know, mandatory uh, meetings where they were telling us the union was bad and they were punishing people who were organizers and they were firing people and this and that. And so we want another election. And the board said, actually, we're going to change the rules uh, or we're going to re we're going to go back to the way that it used to be. And instead of offering you another election, we're just going to say you got the union at Semex. How much was the Teamsters anticipating that? You know, I am How not... How much were you anticipating that? Uh, to the extent that you I, could tell well, us. I've been writing about a brute. I first profiled the brute so uh, a year and a half ago. Uh, so uh, uh, I have been waiting for something like this. And I wrote about her memo uh, as soon as she got on the job uh, saying, hey, we should look at, uh, go back to Joy Silk. You know, when I when I started talking uh, on that article, uh, uh, a, a very uh, one of the best labor law professors in the country told me no one even remembered Joy Silk. It hadn't been law for 52 years. Uh, so this has been creeping up, you know, and I should also add that the board issued its decision at a time when most of the labor beat reporters were on vacation, so it still hasn't been reported adequately in May in you know in the in the national press where you would think it would have been. Yeah, um, the Teamsters already you know have had considerable strategizing about Amazon. There's no question about that, and I think there were aspects of the UPS contract that were not only good, uh, obviously for UPS workers but really were there with an eye towards Amazon and particularly like, the you know, uh, compelling the company to stop, uh, you know, the camera surveilling uh, their, their drivers. Well, who are the most surveilled by camera right. workers in the world? It's the Amazon warehouse workers. So the Teamsters have been, you know, revving this up. They have maintained a, a 
good organizing department. Um, and I, I, I think they're at this point, you know, they're getting ready to pounce. Uh, you know, it's not clear to me uh, exactly what other unions are going to do. I mean, w we know for a fact that the auto workers and other unions have been uh, have not been successful organizing all of the plants in the South, many of them owned uh, by, you know, companies headquartered elsewhere that are unionized in that elsewhere in their home. Right. Uh, was it Mississippi that had that uh, Volkswagen plant? Was that the, yeah. the big yeah. one that... Uh, yeah, well, that was yeah. Tennessee, the Volkswagen oh, Tennessee, sorry. Yes, Chattanooga. Yes. Yeah, but I mean, uh, also, uh, I think it was Nissan in uh, in, in Mississippi, uh, BMW, uh, Air, the um, uh, Boeing has this factory now in South Carolina where the rate of unionization is 2.9%. Uh, you know, they, they've all struck out. Uh, you know, now would be the time to go back. Uh, and, and, you know, uh, obviously the auto workers have got to deal uh, immediately with the big three uh, or the legacy three. But, you know, after that, all those factories and the factories springing up now, uh, you know, that are uh, lithium ion battery factories and electric car, you know, they're now much more plausible targets for successful organizing than they were at the beginning of last week. So um, what, I mean, we will we will get a sense. I mean, I guess, you know, I would imagine we, we'll be able to read from labor reporters in the next couple of months, which unions are saying we are now dedicating 5%, 8%, yeah. 9% to, to organizing. And by that, uh, they mean for folks who, who aren't aware, we're going to go out and find shops or we're going to put out more resources for people who come to us and they're working at this shop or that shop, or we're going to, uh, uh, we're going to see this industry or that industry. And we're going to go there and we're going to see if there's interest in the workers there forming a union and we're going to provide them support. We're going to provide them uh, training. We're going to provide them know-how and we're going to get this going to expand uh, the uh, uh, unionization across the country. If the Teamsters, like how much, like I would imagine also though, like Amazon has got to be a little bit freaked out right now, <laughs> right? Starbucks. Well, not just, not Starbucks. just Amazon. This, I mean, is, they, this is really, uh, you know, a, a blow that, uh, you know, they may have feared, you know, uh, but w was not foremost in their minds. And there's a whole industry, a un there's a whole union suppression industry, law firms like Littler Mendelssohn and, and what have you. And, you know, they're looking at this and saying, oh, my God, you know, I mean, this is 80 percent of our business. Uh, what are we still permitted to do? What they're still permitted to do, of course, is to try to get, you know, the courts to uh, reverse this. Uh, that what now, the, what's what's your sense of that? I mean, I mean, because they're this is their livelihood. I mean, it would be like as if there's a ruling out there uh, tomorrow that all of a sudden said, like, yeah, no more um, political YouTube shows. You can't you can't do any more political podcasts. And I would be like, well, wait a second. But that's what these union busting firms are, are hearing today is that like their very practices, because it was always built into the just sort of the cost of doing business. We're going to get fined for this. But at the end of the day, the the breaches in labor law that we practice will inhibit a union from showing up even in that second election, because we'll have already done the damage and we get fined for it. Fine. That's just well, the cost. They, of the they, they don't get fined for it. It's the employer who gets fined. Well, that's for what it. I'm they saying. Paid yeah. for it. Oh, right. Yes. Uh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right. But, so but there's from no the, downside for them. This is, this is their, meat. Well, but this is a downside yeah. for them because all of yes. a sudden the employer's like, we can't yeah. hire you anymore because hiring you is going to guarantee a union. Yeah. Well, in, if the, if this takes the normal uh, course through the courts, it probably would take a couple years to reach the Supreme Court. On the other hand, the court, you know, the right wingers on the court have uh, now got this thing that they do this, you know, preliminary hearing, a uh, major case, whatever it is. Right, major uh, case doctrine, major questions and, doctrine, yes. Yeah, now I don't doubt that, you know, Sam Alito, who was born hating unions, uh, would would love to do that and can get Clarence Thomas along with him. How much in this particular political context, 
the court wants to do that when union approval ratings are about at 70 percent and when millennial and Gen Z union approval rating is, uh, according to one poll that the AFL-CIO released yesterday, at 88%. Wow. How much they want to deal with that, you know, I don't know. I don't know if, if the sort of John Roberts, well, not so fast uh, sensibility uh, would, uh, would, would, you know, uh, uh, apply to the, the other conservative justices. We'll see. In terms of knock-on impact, too, I would imagine that if an employer is like looking at this and saying, okay, we can't hire union busting firms now as a way of inhibiting a union. What we're going to have to do, because we don't want a union, what we're going to have to do is like basically come up with better compensation uh, in whatever forms for our workers to stave off a union. So this is going to have, this is going to have that sort of knock on impact that the, the, the fear of a union, because you can't sort of inhibit it by doing unfair labor practices, you're actually going to have to get like more fair labor practices. Like you're going to have to go beyond what you've been doing. It could. And there was an economist at Princeton some years ago, whose name I do not remember, who documented that in industries where at least a quarter of the workers were unionized, non-union companies had to raise wages uh, about 10% higher than non-union companies in industries where there wasn't that much unionization. So it could be, it could be analogous to that, that the, you know, uh, better to raise the wages and the benefits or whatever uh, than to actually have a union, which is, of course, as I said, what would be the effect of uh, that brief that Abruzzo has uh, submitted to the to the board. All right, I have one more question about the sort of the mechanics of this, and then I just want to get into just one other question about the timing uh, that you sure. wrote about. Um, one of the things that it, it this ruling also applies to pending cases. What uh, if I understand what? What does that mean? In other words, like Trader Joe's is going back and they, they, they are saying like we had unfair uh, labor practices and, you know, uh, for the elections, but like, are there cases in front of the board or like stacked up waiting to be heard from the board of unfair labor practices following other elections with the hope of getting another election that would now be ruled like, okay, there were unfair, uh, unfair labor practices boom, uh, your union's recognized? That is a great question to which I cannot give you a definitive answer, but I would assume, okay, it's clear that any unfair labor practice uh, that, well, first, first of all, there is a bit of a couple month period, I think, before uh, this uh, is, is uh, you know, enrolled as policy. So uh, I, I don't think there is this immediate, uh, uh, you know, way to invoke it for uh, cases that are well, well along in the pipeline. Uh, but, you know, uh, uh, every day uh, uh, Starbucks is essentially not bargaining in good faith with, uh, uh, you know, the baristas who have voted, uh, voted in the union uh, and, you know, if uh, they're doing that today, if they're saying, no, we're not going to show up this week, call us, uh, call us after Christmas, uh, you know, that puts them in jeopardy. That puts them in jeopardy. Okay. So um, the other thing I wanted to, to mention that you, you, you uh, mentioned on in your piece is that the timing of this was really important because of one of the uh, Biden appointees to the board, Glenn, uh, Gwen, uh, Gwen Wilcox, yeah, is about to expire. Right. Will you will you walk us through this because you wrote that Schumer and Biden <laughs> were waiting for Republicans because the tradition has been, and it it like I can just f like feel the agita as I say the word tradition. <laughs> yes has been that there's going to be a Republican and a, a Democrat um, the sort of like nominees 
appointed simultaneously, and they were waiting for the Republicans to do this because we all know how much the Republicans adhere to norms and traditions when Democrats have power. And so, of course, it was very surprising that they didn't do this. This is infuriating. It is. But uh, uh, since I've written that, uh, uh, it is now uh, Schumer has since made clear that he's going to bring this up uh, for a vote just for uh, to, to confirm Wilcox. And it, it went through the uh, Senate Health, Education, Labor, whatever the hell it's called, committee. which The Health me- Committee, yep. Yeah, and uh, Murkowski voted to confirm uh, uh, in the committee. Uh, and Schumer, I think, thinks he's got his 50 votes, if necessary, with Vice President Harris breaking the tie. So wow. uh, they have been waiting around, but, uh, you know, uh, a gong sounded somewhere and uh, Schumer and I guess the administration as well realized, OK, McConnell ain't going to do this no matter what. Uh, so to hell with that. We're just going to put Wilcox up by her by her lonesome and put her back on the board. Oh, that's huge. Because yes, that, because that means because will you just explain this dynamic that you need a specific quorum to make sort of like policy level decisions versus just adjudicating specific cases. Yes. It's a five member board. uh, And uh, the arrangement as is the case with many of the independent agencies uh, is that the president's party has three appointees and the uh, other party gets two. Now at the, at the moment the board has only four members because uh, (laughs) You know, one of the Republicans retired, and precisely because he hoped the re- Democrats would stall if there weren't, it wasn't a Republican, McConnell has refused for a year to put anyone forward. But, if, and if the board is down to just three members, which it would be if Wilcox is n- no longer a member, uh, it can only essentially affirm previous rulings. It cannot make any new rulings. And so, for instance, this petition that uh, uh, Abruzzo has made to the board about what happens if uh, the employer isn't bargaining in good faith, they couldn't rule on that. They'd only have three members. So it it matters a great deal if Wilcox is confirmed. And it seems that uh, Schumer et al. have finally realized the hell with it. We've got the 50 votes. Let's do it. That is, um, I, I... I am both, you know, amazed that it took them a year to come to this and amazed that they've actually come to this if they actually do come to this. I mean, I guess I understand that, like, having Murkowski jump in because Joe Manchin, very easy to imagine, particularly right now, that Joe Manchin would not vote to to reconfirm uh, Wilcox and uh, Kristen Sinema as well. Uh, You could also imagine she not voting to confirm. Um, And, you know, when you see this with Murkowski, I I wonder if the decision uh, about the... um, the uh, federal leases and the uh, the oil drilling that Murkowski so desperately wanted uh, six to eight months ago, if this isn't part of that dynamic. Well, obviously, we're, we, we do not know the answer to that other than that. Well, it would make sense. <laughs> right. Um, it, it, uh, it, it's so messed up that we yes. have to trade. Yeah. Um, the uh you know the the burning of the planet uh to get uh labor protections in 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 some instances uh but um that's where we are uh harold i really appreciate your walking us through this like you say no one you 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 know your piece has been essentially the piece uh that has been written about this the only other place i've seen anybody write about this frankly is in um law offices yeah, uh, because they uh, either with you know because they've got to tell their clients like y- you guys go watch out now. Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, like I said, uh, this my piece was not intended to be a scoop, but I seem to be the only one on the labor beat who wasn't on vacation last Friday, <laughs> and uh, there you have it. 
Yep, it's uh, it's it's really great. We're going to hear more about this, I think, uh, going forward. Uh, Harold yeah. Meyerson, we will obviously link to your piece at the American Prospect. Again, um, a- anytime I can sort of just remind people, go over and support the prospect. Everything is, um, nothing is paywalled there, uh, but obviously um, people, you know, uh, the, it, it costs money to operate that, and it's the it, it's been just fantastic in uh, in this era of the Biden administration in terms of like both covering what they're doing and I think pushing uh, what 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 the, the a yeah. lot of the good stuff the the Biden administration is doing. So, we, uh, you we know, push. yes, uh, really appreciate the work you're doing over there. And thanks so much. Thank for you, talking Sam. To us about it. Really appreciate your broadcast.